On a lonely planet, slowly spinning its way to damnation, amid the incompetence and unpreparedness of lesser space programs, one team stands resilient against the herds, putting their lives on the line to aid those who were previously unaware of the quick save option. Yes, it's the incredible adventures of Jebediah and his crack team of Kerbinauts. They are the Blunderbirds. Saving the Kerbin race, one stranded explorer at a time. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of The Blunderbirds in which we're going to be rescuing KSP Paul's Kerbals that he has unfortunately left stranded on the surface of Tylo. Yes, Tylo is not a body to be underestimated. You can see his lander's fairly well designed in the sense that it has enough thrust to weight ratio to get off the surface, but looking at the Kerbal Engineer readouts, we only have 713 meters per second uh, of Delta V remaining, which is obviously uh, quite a long way off the 2270 meters per second that's generally required to you know, get into Tylo orbit. So we're going to go ahead and rescue his Kerbals today using this thing here, Blunderbird 5. The first stage consists of a small cluster of vector engines in the core and then we have three side boosters feeding into the central stage in an onion setup. I know most of you are familiar with asparagus staging. Uh, onion staging is kind of like a simplified version of asparagus in that instead of the boosters all feeding into each other and dropping off in sequence, they all just feed, you know, at, at the same time into the central booster and then drop off at the same time. It's it's much easier to do and I couldn't really be bothered to set up asparagus staging. And it's slightly more realistic in the sense that while at the moment, to my knowledge, no rocket in real life uses any kind of fuel pumping because it's too expensive and complicated. The proposed Falcon Heavy, which SpaceX is currently building and apparently it's going to fly this year, which is very exciting, uh, that will use a uh, cross feed and that's just going to be well, for those of you that don't know, the Falcon Heavy is essentially three Falcon 9s all strapped together and the two peripheral boosters all kind of feed their fuel into the central tank so when they detach, the central one still has fuel in it, if that makes sense. Um, but at the moment, it's not a thing, but hopefully it will be soon. And, well, I suppose it's a bit late now to mention that they've detached, but I guess we can talk about the rest of the rocket. Uh, I think the most obvious thing with it is the fact that it doesn't have a payload fairing. Um, some of you may be familiar with this rocket already. I did build it in a live stream. Uh, there's only been a few modifications I've made since that live stream, one of them being that nose cone at the top, and also I changed up the heat shield to be an inflatable one rather than a standard ablative one, just to provide a little bit more protection for the lower command module. Uh, but like I was saying, I've tried. I tried putting this thing in a payload fairing. There goes the uh, aerodynamic nose cone. I tried putting this thing in a payload fairing, but unfortunately the Kraken just kept on shaking it apart. I tried all sorts of different combinations. I even tried launching this thing with all the cheat codes activated and then deactivating them once the vessel spawns in, which is what sometimes is required, especially for my bigger SSTOs. Uh, you have to kind of launch them with crash damage and collision and everything turned off. And then once the physics have loaded and the vessel has spawned in, then you can deactivate them. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't work in this case. Whilst it did spawn, it started shaking itself to pieces by the time it got to the upper atmosphere. Um, so I kind of a compromise I went with was putting that nose cone at the top. It probably didn't make too much of a difference because it didn't really do a good job in covering up the uh, peripheral boosters of the Tylo lander, which is the thing at the top of the stack. But it makes it look slightly more rocket shaped and maybe it might have made a small difference, I don't really know. I do know that this thing does work perfectly well uh, without any kind of aerodynamic nose cone at all because I flew this entire mission on live stream just to make sure it worked before going ahead and filming it and doing the rescue itself. So. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't matter too much. So, if any, if any of you want to um, download the craft file from the description and try and see if you can get a fairing to work, then you know, feel free to do so and you know, tweet at me or put it, put it on my Discord, which is all of which are in the description because I, I just, I just couldn't, I, could, I just couldn't. So we're going to be going to Jewel by doing two burns at Periapsis, not only because it's more efficient to do so, but also because the thrust to weight ratio of the nuclear engines is very poor, and uh, it would be very it would be very inefficient to do the whole burn at Periapsis because the burn is incredibly long. You just want me a moment ago detaching some liquid fuel tanks, that's because this time we do have an asparagus set up for the upper stage, just to maximise our efficiency with the nuclear engines, and we'll just drop off the tanks as and when they're depleting. But, um... This thing is very over-engineered for what it needs to be, to be honest. We have more than enough fuel for this mission. I kind of... I just like being lazy sometimes. Like, I've already... I do a lot of SSTO missions in which efficiency is key, so when I get the chance to do a rocket, I like just being lazy. I think it's a little bit more fun to not have to worry about, you know, oh, do I, enough, do, I, do I have enough fuel for this mission? Do I need to get this encounter to be as precise as possible? So sometimes it's nice to be lazy. And it's nice uh, in the sense that it makes the mission a bit more replicatable. 
replicable, <laughs> especially if you download the craft file from the description. And, uh, well, yeah, that's the end of that thought process there. And you can see me now getting our Tylo encounter. So I actually managed to get this first time, uh, first try, which is uh, quite unusual for me. It's not the most efficient Tylo encounter, mind. The best place to encounter Tylo is at your dual periapsis. And if I played around with this long enough, I probably could have managed, well, I, I could have been, I could have done that, but... Uh, again, like I like I just mentioned, we have more than enough fuel for this mission, and I got the Tyler encounter first time. I thought, you know what, this is fine. We have enough fuel. Um, I don't want to have to spend ages faffing around trying to get the best possible encounter. So this is fine. This is fine. So we're just sort of tweaking our maneuver note here, and then I realised that actually I would kind of done that wrong. It needs to be on the other side of Tylo, so we're encountering it. Uh, as in our Tylo orbit will be in the same direction as Tylo's rotation. It's going to be 570 meters per second to circularize. Again, we probably could have shaved a little bit of delta V off that if we'd got a better encounter, but as mentioned, we have more than enough fuel, and, you know, the the Kerbals that are stranded there, they, they're, they're getting bored. We need to get this mission done as fast as we can. So, you know, speed was a thing I was thinking about. <laughs> Okay, so we've encountered Tylo's Sphere of Influence, we're just going to time warp down to its periapsis. The burn's going to be fairly short, although it says six minutes there. Yeah, now we've actually done the burn. The physics engine has uh, recalibrated itself to Tylo, and it's only going to take just over three minutes to do the burn, so not very long at all. And as we shed fuel tanks and things, there we go, it's going to be faster and faster. Uh, the burn's going to be even quicker once we've actually dropped that massive Tylo lander there. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with Tylo, uh, it's it's one of the I'd say it's the hardest place. Well, I, I I'm I'm very confident in saying it is the hardest place to land on in the solar system. It's very analogous to Eve in the sense that Eve is the hardest place to take off from, and Tylo is the hardest place to land on. Uh, this is something I've said before in video, so I will try I try not to touch on this topic too much for fear of sounding like a broken record, but. Yeah, it takes a huge amount of fuel to land on, but it doesn't take... It, well, I mean, it takes a lot of fuel to take off from, but it's very easy to take off from. Tylo is essentially the same size as Kerbin and has the same gravity. I know there's a very small difference in that Kerbin's gravity is slightly higher and it takes slightly more delta V. But for all intents and purposes, and for practicality's sake, Tylo is the same. And so, whilst it's very easy to land on Kerbin, because you can use parachutes and use the atmosphere to slow down, Tylo has no atmosphere, so it takes a tremendous amount of fuel to uh, slow down sufficiently and land on the surface. But we've circularized now. I've gone for an orbit of about, well, I'm still tweaking it, but I'm going to go for an orbit of about 70 kilometers. This is just a good uh, orbit. You don't want to have an orbit too low because then you're, well, at least in the case of this lander, the lander won't have enough time to slow itself down before it hits the surface. Uh, will be too low. So you need to start from a fairly high height just to give ourselves enough sort of space, I suppose, to slow ourselves down sufficiently. Um, but yeah, the, the, the orbit we've got now is a pretty good height. So in fact, we went for 80 kilometers in the end. We're just going to change our inclination as well. So our orbit passes over the stranded lander just so we can get our encounter as close as possible. And then once all that's done, we can transfer Jebediah into one of those four command pods. In fact, I don't know why, because I originally put four command pods there to send two Kerbals down like the Apollo missions. But for some reason, I just, I didn't do that and just sent Jeb down. I think I was had in my mind that there were three Kerbals stranded on the surface, not two but whatever the reason i kind of went with a cluster of four command pods here is because there is no four seat command pod in ksp that's you know a good it's kind of a good size there is that hitchhiker storage module but it's very heavy for what it is and it doesn't have any control you can't use it to control the vessel so i kind of went with a cluster here i tried very hard to arrange them in the in a way that you know if this was like a, a solid command pod there would be enough space for four kerbals to sit in there nice and comfortably um, so you know, just use your, gotta use a little bit of imag imagination there. Um, there's just that fuel tank at the top. That's just to raise the uh, docking port a little bit above the surface. There's not, there's no fuel tanks to uh, clip between the command pods. And uh, what else do we need to talk about? Oh yeah, the electricity is being generated by an RTG that you can see uh, at the moment. It's to the, to the, is, we're rotating now, but it's to the right of the docking port right now. And then we're just gonna finalize our descent detaching the last of the peripheral tanks which were in an asparagus set up like the nuclear engine liquid fuel tank stage in the mothership and there's our lander stranded um well now it's uh, a mere three point something kilometers away i won't know for sure until we touch down 3.7 kilometers or oh, is going to stay at 3.8 looks like it's going to stay at 3.8 which is a fairly close encounter the way i managed to get oh Yep, 3.8. <laughs> it's a fairly close encounter. The way I managed to uh, get that a uh, fairly close approach was just by quick saving and quick loading and doing the landing quite a few times until I managed to work out 
uh, when I needed to start my suicide burn uh, to get that close encounter. So do not worry if you don't get a perfect encounter first time if you're trying to do a similar sort of mission. But there we go, Jebediah can go on his EVA. Tyler landers need to have ladders that extend all the way to the floor because jetpacks do not work at all because the gravity is too high. And we can do our obligatory flag plant. There we go, the Blunderbird's insignia uh, proudly displayed on Tylo's surface. And then Jebediah can get back in his module and do nothing because he's too lazy to run all the way. I mean, you know, 3.9, 3.8 kilometers is a fairly long way to run in a big heavy spacesuit. So I'm not going to make him run the distance. But then KSP pulls Kerbals, you know, they're stranded, they're hungry. They're probably not up to running the distance either. But luckily, he does have a lot of fuel left in the lander, so we can use that remaining fuel to fly ourselves over to the rescue craft and minimize the amount of running our Kerbals have to do. Um, it wasn't the most graceful flight, I'll be the first to admit, but you know, if it works and it ain't stupid, then it's not stupid, right? <laughs> I was kind of just sort of winging this, trying to get as close as possible, and there we go, with a mere 44 meters per second of fuel remaining, so we managed to cut that quite close. Uh, but yeah, we can get his Kerbals on an EVA, I'll, I'll play this in sort of fast motions, you have to watch the entire thing. Um, but yeah, not much more else to say about that really, so... Uh, we can start thinking about, you know, getting ourselves into a low tilo orbit and get ourselves an encounter with Blunderbird 5, which to me is always one of the more fun parts of the mission. Uh, we can set it as our... Well, hang on. We can set it... Yeah, we can set it as the target now. There we go. Now, normally for Kerbin, you'd want to start your... You want to start lifting off uh, quite a way before the... Um, before your, the thing you want to dock with is above you. But in this case, Tyler has no atmosphere, so when we lift off, we can essentially start burning uh, flat almost immediately. We want to be looking at, if you look at the Kerbal Engineer readouts on the left-hand side of the altitude gauge, you can see the second one down is time to apoapsis. You want to try and keep that number as low as possible, but never sort of below one second, because then that's cutting it quite close. So try and get that as close as possible, and that just ensures that you're spending as much uh, you're expending as much fuel as possible into increasing your horizontal speed versus uh, increasing your vertical speed because, you know, altitude will the altitude will increase as you pick up horizontal speed anyway, so we don't want to spend too much uh, time burning for vertical speed. So yeah, kind of hovering around the 1.5 second mark at this point. We want to launch when our mothership is almost directly above us because we're accelerating very quickly. There's no atmosphere to slow us down, so we're very quickly catching up to the speed of the mothership that we want to dock with. So there's no if you if you launch it kind of when it's a long way behind you, then it's going to you know you're going to undershoot. And not to mention as well, whilst we're still climbing in altitude, we're actually be going uh, faster relatively because we're kind of on the inside of our target's orbit, so we'll be going faster than our target. But there we go, we have a separation of 0.1 kilometers with, if we factor in that very small burn there, which is very, very nice thing to get straight off the bat. It might take you a few attempts to get this kind of docking. I'm just, I can get these kind of dockings quite fast because I've done it so many times at this point. But yeah, cancelling our maneuver node just as we're about to finish. And there we go, a separation of zero kilometers, which is um, obviously a pretty good encounter. We managed to get this. I always like to challenge myself in, this, in trying to get an encounter with a mothership before we've actually completed a full orbit. I just find that to be the most satisfying way of doing encounters. And there is Blunderbird 5. I might, <laughs> I've just noticed actually the Kerbal portraits are all glitched out. Unfortunately that's just an artifact of the, of the way these command modules are clipped together. But um, like I say, if we just you know use our common sense we can see that there is clearly enough space inside those command modules for those Kerbals to sit there nice and comfortably without being horribly disfigured. And look at that, that's about as good a docking as you can get really, I didn't even need to use the monopropellant. Uh, for those of you wondering where the monopropellant tanks are, I'm just using the tanks inside the command modules. And we may as well ditch the lander now, so I can pump all the remaining liquid fuel from the lander back into the mothership, obviously leaving the oxidizer, and pump the surplus monopropellant from the uh, Blunderbird 5 mothership into the lander cans. Um, and then what we can do is we can deorbit ourselves briefly, or as in put ourselves on a collision course with Tylo, detach the lander after obviously uh, transferring the Kerbals into the mothership, and then quickly accelerate again so that the mothership itself will not crash into the surface. And then we can think about getting ourselves home. So Delta V remaining three th over 3,000 meters per second, which is more than enough. As I've mentioned, this thing is definitely over-engineered, so I'm not worried at this point. We're definitely going to get home, and we can just you know, watch our lander uh, crash into the surface, because what good is a Kerbal video without some sort of gratuitous explosions? And there we go, and actually, 
the docking port seems to have survived. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's going to crash into this mountain, but no, it actually managed to get back into space. Well, I mean, it was in space anyway, but you know what I mean, get back into an orbit. So we're going to loop back around and see if it can be destroyed on the second pass. And there we go. No real surprises there. It didn't survive. So now that's all done. We can create a maneuver node and get ourselves on an encounter with Kerbin. Uh, due to our inclination, we can't actually get our direct curve and encounter straight off the bat, but we can get pretty close and then just do a minimal burn when we're in deep uh, interplanetary space to do the final correction. So, so yeah, really. Uh, when I did this on live stream, this it's 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 a lot harder to do this sort of thing when you're burning from Tylo itself. So some of you may find it easier to just leave Tylo's sphere of influence and then burn from Jewel. Uh, from like a dual orbit rather than a tile orbit. That's certainly what I did in the live stream because time was a bit more of the essence there because I, I appreciate it. I didn't want the live stream to run too long so I did the burn from dual. So this thing does have enough fuel to do that burn as in do the burn at dual orbit if you know if necessary. So some of you at this point may be wondering why our electric charge hasn't you know gone down at any point during this mission or you know gone down significantly. Uh, I've not got the infinite electricity cheat uh, turned on. Uh, actually what I've got is a couple of RTGs clipped inside the decoupler that you can see underneath the heat shield or at least you'll see it when I exit the map view I can show you just there briefly but yeah we've got some batteries inside there and a couple of RTGs just to generate our electricity because solar panels don't work that well as like when we're as far out as Joule because it's so far away from the sun solar panels aren't that useful that's not to say they don't work at all they do work just not very well um, if you've got a smaller craft especially like a good a good example is my Elu and Lathe SSTO that only used solar panels but we only had one command pod module i didn't really use that much electricity so solar panels can work you know in some cases but for big ships it's, it's often far easier just to use rtgs uh like i did in this case so that's why the electric charge can go down but we can see our getting our doing our burn to get our final curve and encounter now the way i like to do these or an easy way of doing it at least is to make it so your orbit around the sun sort of passes over Kerbin's orbit, even if you're not encountering Kerbin, as long as it intersects Kerbin's orbit, that's fine. And then once you've passed that in uh, the encounter point, create a maneuver node and just drag on retrograde and prograde until you can get the uh, the encounter nodes to kind of circle around and meet each other, if that makes any sense at all. I did talk about this topic in a little bit more detail in my Low Tech to Gilly video, which is kind of like a semi-tutorial in how to get to Gilly. And the methods for getting a Gilly encounter from a low EVE orbit is very similar to getting a Kerbin encounter from a solar orbit. Um, but here we are at Kerbin's. We've got a periapsis of 32,000, which is very, very low, and we're going in very fast. But luckily, we have this gigantic uh, heat shield. I did check the difficulty settings, and in fact, KSP Pool plays at 110% re entry heating. So good on you, sir. But luckily, this thing can still work at 110% re entry heating. Uh, probably at 120%, actually, but you know, I can't verify that because I haven't tried it. Uh, I use the inflatable heat shield, I think I mentioned this earlier, but I use the inflatable shield because it does a better job of shielding the two command pod modules that we have here. The ablative one uh, tended to not shield the, the lower command pod that we have for the rescued Kerbals as well as the uh, as the top module. So I went with the inflatable one just to provide as much, as much shelter from the heat as possible. But I think it's pretty safe to say that we're nice and safe now we're getting into the lower atmosphere with our parachutes deploying. We probably have too many, but I don't care. <laughs> and then we're going to detach, detach the inflatable shield and settle down and watch ourselves uh, finish the descent and begin our splashdown. Well, I do the splashdown, I suppose. And that pretty much wraps this video up. So if you have any questions, leave them below or alternatively reach me on Twitter or Discord uh, on the server, all of which are linked in the description. And on screen now, top left is the music video version of this video, which I was very proud of and it's not monetized, so I hope you enjoy that if you want to watch that. Top right is just my most recent upload, whatever that may be, and the bottom right was specially selected for you by YouTube's algorithm. So other than that, I hope you have a good day.